Hello and welcome. I am Cindy Cornell, the career coach for working professionals here at the Yale School of Management. I'm so pleased today to welcome Jeff Schwartz back to SOM. Jeff graduated in 1987 and he went on to do some pretty remarkable things. He's the founder of Deloitte's Future of Work Practice and since 2011 has been the editor of the firm's Global Human Capital Trends Report. He's lived and worked around the world and uh, including two stints with the Peace Corps. And until grounded by COVID-19, he was pretty happy to spend a significant amount of his time on airplanes. The, pandef the pandemic offered a respite from travel and the opportunity for him to organize his thoughts about uh, work and uh, workforce trends and practices into his book, Work Disrupted, Opportunity, Resilience and Growth in the Accelerated Future of Work. You might recall I referenced his, referenced his book hot off the presses in January in our webinar, Reimagining Your Career in 2021, which brings us to our discussion today. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really glad to be with you and with this group of Yale alums and friends. So we'll kick off now. I think you're gonna start off with a few slides to give us a sense of what's in the book. And after that, we're going to uh, move into a discussion, you and I, and we'll leave room at the end for questions from the audience. So to the extent that you do have questions, please uh, populate them into the Q&A and we will get them towards the end of our session today. Great. Cindy, are we good to go? Can you see the, the presentation? It looks great. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, excellent. All right, hands are raised. We're, we're, we're 14 months in, we're learning how to Zoom. Okay, so uh, Cindy, again, thank you uh, for having me as a, as a Yale SOM alum and a, a very uh, proud alum. Um, I, I, I literally think every day about some of the things that I learned when I was uh, at Yale, way before Evans Hall, 135 Prospects, the Hall of Mirrors, a very different campus experience, but just a great experience as well. So what I'm going to talk about um, uh, this afternoon, this morning, if you're on, if you're uh, to the west of me, are just a couple of core ideas in, in my book, um, uh, Work Disrupted, um, and then conclude with, with some thoughts that hopefully it will be relevant as we're all trying to, to navigate um, uh, multi-decade careers in these hundred-year lives that that Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott of London Business School tell us that we're living. Uh, and then really looking forward to the conversation um, uh, that, um, that we'll have. Okay, so let me just try to set the stage um, this way. This is a picture of the cover of my book. Um, we were all, most of us were really excited about 2020 until 2020 actually hit, right? For those of us in management consulting, for those of us in business or government or not-for-profit organizations, we all had these 2020 plans. 2020 was supposed to be, we're remembering it a little bit, if it's funny when you remember, 2020 was supposed to be a magical year. We were gonna have, we, you know, in, in all through the last decade, we were creating 2020 strategies, 2020 scenarios. 2020 was when the future was going to arrive. And in, a, in an interesting way, in an ironic way, in 2020, the future did arrive, um, but it wasn't exactly the future that we had expected. And it happened much more quickly um, and in much more dramatic ways than we thought. There's uh, an amazing quote, an amazing insight from Anne-Marie Slaughter. Anne-Marie is um, the president of New America. It's the foundation of Think Tank in Washington former dean of the, of the Graduate School of uh, International Affairs at Princeton, where, where I also had an opportunity to study, um, and the first woman to be the head of the policy planning staff um, at the State Department, one of the most prestigious positions at the State Department. And Anne-Marie said, in the third week of March of 2020, not last March, the March before, just a few weeks into the pandemic, she said something like that the coronavirus and its economic and social aftermath <clears throat> is like a time machine to the future. And things that we thought would take five or 10 years took five or 10 weeks. And in some cases, five or 10 days. And sort of that's sort of the context that we're thrust into in, in Work Disrupted. Let me put it in context. This book is not titled Work Accelerated. 
right? And, we, and, and although we live in an accelerated world, what's happened recently is different and more than acceleration. It's literally a shift, right? And it's recognizing these shifts that's sort of critical. I sort of joke that you could have written the book work accelerated a decade ago, right? Now we're thinking about the shifts. So what does it mean to think about leading and navigating careers in a changed world? Um, sort of the metaphor for this book is you can't navigate 21st century careers and work with 20th century maps, mindsets, and mental models. Um, and there's a great quote, which unfortunately I found after the book was being edited at Wiley. So it's not in the book, but it, there are many similar quotes in the book from Albert Einstein, who said, you can't use an old map to navigate a new world. Although, as I often say in discussions, um, many executives are trying to do exactly that. They're using 20th century maps and mindsets to do it. Um, as you see, there's a few cartoons here. These cartoons are all in my book. We were very fortunate to work with, you know, one of the great business cartoon illustrators in the world, Tom Fishburne. I'm sure you've seen his work in many places. And, and Tom worked with us to develop 25 cartoons and illustrations for the book, which I think are, are Pretty, are pretty fun and because the idea is to make this topic accessible, not just um, insightful. Um, and, and let me just sort of summarize it and we could, and I'm gonna give a couple of more examples. What are these shifts about, right? What does it mean to shift, to think about the work in a future oriented mindset versus a 20th century or a scientific management mindset? One of my former colleagues at, um, uh, at Deloitte, uh, also a former McKinsey partner, John Hagel, um, ran the Center for the Edge for many years with John Seeley Brown. And, and I love the way John put it, which is basically where a lot of us are talking about the future of work, but one of the most fundamental questions is, what should that work be? And how is work itself changing? And the simple illustration here is that we are often very busy on the left-hand side of the whiteboard thinking about work in its traditional um, frame, thinking about cost minimization, productivity, substitution, automation, control, workflow optimization. By the way, critically important things, but not the only things. Um, and we have an opportunity right now, and we've witnessed this, I believe, in 2020, to really shift into not just a, a cost mindset, but also a value and a meaning and an impact mindset, moving from cost to value, moving from substitution to augmentation and collaboration, moving from optimization to creating impact and meaning beyond traditional productivity, which is a very narrow view, and moving beyond work output, doing the same thing more efficiently, to bringing in passion and creating new work outcomes. That's the shift that we're going through. So as I joked a minute ago, um, how do we get there uh, at Deloitte, uh, where I've been a partner for 20 years, we talk about the trajectory of responding to, co to COVID, recovering from COVID, and then thriving after COVID. How do we get to the post-COVID era? In some parts of the world, it seems very close. In other parts of the world, we're, we're right in the middle of this incredible um, uh, pandemic and economic and, and social crisis. Um, but is the future simply about going faster or is it about actually transforming and shifting the way that we think, you know, my perspective. And, and in the work that we do, this is the way that my book and my thinking is laid out. We look at three major shifts going on effectively together. Um, the reimagination of work, which, which we call the re-architecting of work. We think it's, I think it's not enough to imagine the future. We actually need to build new futures. Um, how do we think about going from output to outcome and then new combinations of how people and technology work together? I'll talk about that very briefly in one second. How the workforce itself is changing, um, how we're moving from an enterprise employee focus to a workforce ecosystem focus and how workforce potential in many ways is as important as the skills that the workforce brings into the organization. Right, and, I'll, and I'll, touch, I'll mention that in one second. And then the third piece, which in many ways in 2021 is the first issue, is how we are moving to adaptive, flexible, and hybrid 
workplace is and how, although work, it's quaint to say today, work used to be a place that we went. Now work is how we actually do it. And we do things like we're doing today. And that includes a lot of Zooming, a lot of blue jeaning, a lot of Google meeting, a lot of Skyping, a lot of Microsoft teaming. I'm, um, I'm forgetting somebody's uh, technology. Um, I apologize for that. A lot of slacking, if you can say that, uh, is it slacking? Okay. Um, just three or four final points, and then we'll open it up, Cindy, for, for conversation. One of the biggest shifts that we're looking at right now is how, and we could spend an hour or many hours, or I'm actually teaching a class on this at a couple of business schools here in New York, how humans and machines are changing the relationship. Um, and the traditional mindset that we have is that technology replaces humans in work, the substitution strategy. Um, but if we look at you know, adding the ATM machine to retail banking. We added the ATM machine to retail banking in the late 1970s. Lo and behold, the number of retail bankers in the United States doubled in 40 years. The number of branches went up considerably. Now, of course, you needed fewer people to work in each branch, but also if, you looked, if we look at what happened, the job of everybody in a bank branch changed. Because when I was growing up and I went to the bank in the 1960s and 1970s, we deposited money and we withdrew money, right? Now, when you go to the bank, you can get financial advice, you can open different accounts, you can talk about a mortgage, you can potentially deal with a, with a risk issue. Um, and then my favorite uh, example is something that's near and dear to us as uh, MBA grads, which is how the introduction of the spreadsheet in the 1970s changed finance. It's hard to remember because it was before I was actually an MBA. I did my MBA from uh, 85 to 87 uh, in New Haven. But before we invented VisiCalc and Lotus 1, 2, 3, and then Excel, in order to do a net present value calculation, we had to do it with a big piece of graph paper and a calculator. And it could take all day to run those scenarios. Now, of course, we run them instantaneously because of the, of the software that we have. And you could imagine people predicting in the 1970s, oh, you know, we have this great software called the spreadsheet, so we're not gonna need financial analysts anymore, right? Well, the opposite happened because once we added the ability to do the calculation part, we actually opened up the work of financial analysts to actually understand investor needs, corporate needs, product um, opportunities, market opportunities much more deeply um, and focus more on relationships. Let me give one other example. And, and the reason I'm giving this example, Cindy, is there's a word here that you would not expect to come into a healthcare discussion or a future of work discussion. And that's the word renaissance. Now, I wish that I inserted the word renaissance into the discussion. Um, I actually picked it up from a brilliant doctor, Eric Topol. Eric Topol uh, is an MD uh, out of San Diego. He wrote an amazing book. He's written many amazing books, but one of the books he's written is a book called Deep Medicine, which is on AI and healthcare. Totally recommend it. There's a chapter in that book that I, I uh, assigned in one of my MBA classes on doctors and patterns. And he looks at the relationship between radiologists and AI. And we sort of know from popular literature that there are many things that AI can do in terms of reading digital scans as well or better than even a really good radiologist. So the question becomes, what does she do? What does a radiologist do when a big part of your work, not dissimilar from the retail banker, can be done by a machine? And the expression that Dr. Tobel uses, that Eric uses is, we need to ask ourselves, what is the Renaissance version of the work we are doing? What does a radiologist do when she can stand on the shoulders of the technology, where parts of the work that she's doing can be done by and with a machine? and then spend more time, this is the other expression Eric uses, to use the gift of time that we get as a Renaissance worker, to focus on the uniquely human value added things that we can do. You know, the Renaissance radiologists can come up with more treatment options. They can spend more time with doctors on those treatment strategies. They can spend more time, as Eric says, as master explainers. I, 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 I joke with people. Imagine if you went to a doctor and she or he actually spent a few minutes talking with you 
about your illness and the treatment and what your family and friends could help you to do to get better versus looking at a computer screen for nine minutes, writing you a script and then pushing you out the door. I'm not being critical of doctors, but that's sort of the experience we have. What's the Renaissance version of what we do? How do we expand our view of the workforce from just our employees to all these different ways that people can work? And, and these things are all increasing. I think it's relative, sorry, I think it's relevant to our discussion on our careers is the way that I put it. We are all gonna work in different ways throughout our lives, right? You'll spend some time as an employee, some time as a contractor, some time as a managed services worker. Maybe we'll do some gigs, some crowds, some all sorts of work, so thinking about that. And then of course, how do we do what we're doing today? Um, which is how do we build these hybrid cultures? Um, and how do we build culture and human relations and social relations? in physical offices, in virtual offices, and everything in between. Let me summarize with just a couple of comments. Um, the way that I close the book is, and this was my advice from my editor at Wiley, um, is I have three chapters, a chapter on uh, growth playbooks for individuals. That chapter is titled Carpe Diem. Um, because a lot of the responsibility in the world in front of us comes to individuals a chapter on growth playbooks for business and organization leaders, which is really focused on creating opportunity and, and partnering and co-creating with the workforce. And then a chapter on uh, citizens and communities looking really just beginning to outline what we need to be thinking about as citizens and members of societies in terms of setting agendas around regulations, education, public policy, financial incentives. And, and I'll, I'll end with just a couple of quick comments. As I mentioned when we started, in 2020, we all became futurists. In a couple of interviews early on when I was talking about the book, Cindy, you know, I get questions like, well, you're a futurist, what do you think is gonna happen? And I, I would sort of joke and said, well, if you've lived through 2020, you're a futurist because you've seen elements of the future. Um, and the really interesting part of the future now is the choices that we will make as individuals and business leaders in society in the next couple of years are highly consequential, in part because of what we've seen as possible and the routes that we choose um, going forward. Um, uh, penultimate comment. Um, these are four of the seven mindsets that I see really um, uh, top of the list for thinking about navigating 21st century careers, not just starting 21st century careers, but navigating careers in 100 year lives where we might work for 50 or 60 years, we spend an average time in a job is three or four years, the half life of a technical skill may be five years or less. So it's one of my partners at Deloitte says you do the math, we're all going to have 12 or 14 jobs and multiple careers. Um, how do we approach that with a growth mindset? I think Carol Dweck's work um, is absolutely essential to this. And we're some great cases on this. Satya Nadella's leadership at Microsoft is a great one. Planning for a long and winding career with multiple chapters. Our careers are not once and done efforts. It's not you, you go to college, you go to Yale or business school, you go to work for a bank or a consulting firm or a, or a tech company, you spend 20 or 30 years there, and then you retire. I mean, that's a quaint idea. Just to be honest, it was sort of the idea of careers when I was at Yale in, in the mid 1980s. That's not what careers look like. Our careers are portfolios of lifelong reinvention, right? And how do you actually prepare for that? How do we, and again, some of these things actually play pretty well to the education, the experience that we had at, certainly I had it at the management school at Yale. How do we hone the mindset of a team player rather than a solo star? And, and an interesting discussion we've had with many business leaders lately is how do we make the team a unit of analysis as well as the individual? Because so much evaluation is done on the individual. And then finally, how do we race with machines, not against them? How do we find the Renaissance version of what we're trying to do? And, and I'll, 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 I'll conclude this way, and this sort of is the sort of topping and tailing of the discussion. I started by talking about this time machine. Um, one way that I like to think about where we are right now in the future of work, I had a wonderful discussion uh, 
a couple of months ago with Tom Friedman, the columnist, and he literally asked me a question, something like, so where are we in the evolution of the future of work? It's a really good question. And what I said to Tom and I'll share with you today is, I think that 2020 was the end of the beginning of the future of work, right? We spent the last 10, 12, 15 years exploring and experimenting with new ways of working, retail and e-commerce, classroom-based learning and e-learning and MOOCs, medicine in the, in, the, in, the, in the doctor's office, in the hospital, and telemedicine, right? These alternative ways of working, if I can put it that way, really became lifelines in 2020, and we saw what was possible. I think the challenge for us now, and this is uh, very much the business leader challenge, but I think it's a challenge as we're all in the workforce and it work, whether it's public sector, private sector, um, uh, or not for profit, is how do we do these future of work? How do we do new ways of working at scale and speed, given what's happened? How do we move beyond experimental, agile at speed, digital at scale and speed? And then of course, and I really haven't spent much time on this, but it's very much a theme of those of us who study at, at, at SOM, is how do we do this in a way that we integrate business and financial value with social values? Because that's one of the sort of top questions out there now. So I will stop because I can go on. What I was trying to do is just give an idea as to where we are in this shift, a little bit about work, workforce and workplace, the Renaissance worker, the open talent economy, where we are in hybrid workplaces, and, and if it's not come through, hopefully it, it did a little bit, how exciting this next period can be, but it is also pretty tumultuous as well. So let's get into a conversation, Cindy. This has been fabulous. Um, and, and I have to tell you that of all the books I got to read during the pandemic, yours was probably my favorite. And, and I'm even very excited about this conversation right now, because as you were talking, I was thinking back to my very first job after college at Deloitte when we were dealing with pen and paper. And I found myself um, serendipitously on the audit technology task force in Pittsburgh. We were one of three offices that was piloting A plus audit software. And we had these giant computers that we trucked around on uh, carts and um, five and a quarter inch floppy disks. And I remember one day having to show one of my audit partners how to put a floppy disk in a computer. So I'd like to think that I'm not that old and that that wasn't that long ago. What world the world looks like today is so dramatically yeah. different. So, Cindy, let, Cindy let, me add, let me add one, well, let me add to that. This is, uh, when I started in consulting in 1988, Right. This gives you a sense. Is, I, I spent a year in investment banking and then I moved into management consulting. We were just starting in management consulting firms to sell proprietary email systems to clients. Right? We were selling them, proprietary email systems. This is the, these are closed systems that we were selling. Right? Mm -hmm. By the way, we didn't have access to it in the firm because right? <laughs> it was too expensive, but we were actually selling them to our, to our initial clients. We didn't even have email. When we started, mm -hmm. of course we did. Of course we um, um, we had PCs, but we didn't have anything like the power that we have now. Right, and and dial in uh, voicemail. Right, you had to dial into a number to, and, and you could actually share your voicemail. I remember this at Deloitte. You could share your voicemail number with one or two close friends or family members and leave messages back and forth. But that that's how we communicated. It was uh, it was a very very different time. So well, I anyway. I, I, jo I joked that voicemail was one of the technologies that disappeared without any proper celebration or funeral. It just sort of faded away. And it was good. <laughs> right. And when somebody calls you, who's calling me? It's 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 you know scary now. Um, this is great. So I'm so glad that you're here, and and I'm sure that people are going to start um, asking questions here soon. Um, and I encourage you to do so if you do have questions for Jeff, but I'm gonna dive right in with one of my questions. Um, from a perspective of career coaching um, and career management, early in your book, it was, I think, page 12, you commented, as a society, we need better ways to help people gain new work skills and transition through multiple careers. 
personally, I, I refer to myself as a recovered accountant. That was my first career. Um, we do tend to look for what we know in the places we've looked before. So what suggestions do you have for preparing for roles in careers that haven't even yet been imagined? So this, these, uh, these are really good questions. These are hard questions. That's a good way of thinking about them being good questions. So let me, let me briefly comment on two sides of the question. So there's a, there's a great quote, which is also included in the book from, um, from Tom, Tom Friedman, who, who says something like that workers today need to prepare for the world like an Olympic athlete that doesn't know what sport she or he is going to be competing in. Um, and it's an interesting question. I'm not a great athlete. One of my daughters is a triathlete. So I know, I, I, I know something about people who are good at athletics. Um, and we know something about what are the enduring capabilities that you need to develop to be a great athlete, regardless of what sport you're competing in, mm -hmm. right? Strength, endurance, Agility, the ability to learn rules, and ability to, in most sports, not all, work with teams or actually work in the swarm of competitors. If you're swimming in a triathlon and there's hundreds of people in the water, I mean, you know, um, um, knowing actually how to sort of navigate through that, through that swarm. Um, and I think that part of that is something that we, we have a sort of yin-yang love-hate relationship with, right? Do we focus on the enduring human capabilities that are critical for these portfo lifelong portfolios of reinvention. And we know what they are, right? They're the ability to learn. I mean, the ability to be an autodidact, to look at it technically, right? Um, the, um, uh, the ability to ask good questions and solve problems. Pablo Picasso has a great quote where he says, the problem with machines is that they only know the answers. We need people to ask really good questions. Um, how, you know, the ability to, to navigate with social and emotional intelligence, the ability to team in all sorts of different, different ways, the ability to communicate really well, the ability to understand data. I, you know, I, sometimes one of my friends, good friends is the chief data scientist at, um, at Deloitte. He's now a fellow at Stanford, writing a book on, on human centered design and AI. And, and Jim has a great expression. He says, we forget that we invented statistics, right? This, machines did not invent data. We invented it as a way of making sense of the world. So being able to think about problems in terms of data and numbers and statistics and visualizing data, these are unique um, uh, capabilities. I think the challenge that we have now is we're so focused sometimes on short-term reskilling, which is really important, that we're not, we don't necessarily have the right balance around capability development, right? And I, I think I made the, I used the example, but I, I mentioned, but I didn't use the example. One of the things that's, we're, that's becoming more important in business today is understanding the potential of the workforce which is different, uh, I, I think I, I'm, I can't remember if I said this this morning or yesterday, but um, you know, we're, what became important in 2020 was not what we hired you to do. What became important in 2020 was what you could do and what you wanted to do, right? So if you were an automotive worker, it was great. We needed you to build cars, but we asked the automotive industry to make ventilators. We said, you know what? slow down a little bit making this machine with 2000 parts that we call an automobile shift your attention to helping us you know source and design and manufacture and distribute this other machine called a ventilator which has 700 parts by the way there's relatively few parts in common between an automobile and a ventilator there are probably some but it's not my field but probably a few and and it's a nice example of what were the enduring capabilities of that industry Right, right. They weren't ventilator manufacturers. They were the manufacturers, designers, sources, distributors of complex machines. Right. And I think that's something that we're starting to um, wrap our minds around um, a little bit more. And as individuals, I think we're constantly going back and forth between do we narrowly reskill or do we build sort of our own machine tool capabilities, our own capability to 
ask questions, solve problems, communicate better, um, work better um, uh, with data, and then to apply that. I, I'm not saying there's, a, 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 there's one answer to that question, but I think we're in this tug of war between narrow reskilling and really building robust human capabilities. I love that point of view um, and, and, and reminding ourselves that, that numbers aren't to be scary. Uh, I found myself more than a couple of times in the early part of the uh, EMBA classwork um, this past year, giving a probability pep talk, uh, reminding the students that if they weren't quant jocks when they arrived, they probably weren't going to be quant jocks when they left. And that's not why they were here anyway. It was really about being curious about the data and helping to ask really smart questions to help the people that are really excited about the data to you know, provide new information that we can actually um, do some new and exciting things with. So I love that. Um, I'd love to kind of shift a teeny bit. You, you mentioned um, what people want to do. And I think that's a question that's coming up a lot as we think about the future of work. Um, in your recent Wall Street Journal article, you uh, suggested that 2022 was going to be the year of musical chairs. And uh, you went on to say that when people have choices about who they work for and where they work, they may decide that there are some hybrid work requirements that just don't suit them. I'm really curious from your perspective, what are the skills that managers and organizations need to start mm. to master to evolve so they don't lose their best talent? Because it seems like we're gonna have a lot of opportunity coming up. Yeah, so there's like at least three or four questions in there, Cindy. So um, yeah, so I, you know, when I say that I think 2022, actually I think later, the latter part of 2021, I think we're already in many industries in this era of musical chairs, but and to be specific, we're, we're seeing a lot of people change jobs and look for other jobs. Not everywhere. Again, there's a question I'd like to come back to about sort of how the future of work agenda is evolving and how it relates to um, social and economic inequality. I want to make, please make sure we get back to that. I want to answer this question and, and come on to that because I think these social and political considerations are a critical part of the choices. But, but on this, um, um, on this specific question, you know, I, the data that I've seen, and I'm sure people have seen similar data in the, in the journal and other publications, by one estimate, one out of five workers, not because they were laid off, but one out of five workers chose to change their job during the last 14, 15 months. So there's been a lot of movement in the last year. And Microsoft just put out a report, I think a couple of weeks ago, where they said the number could be as, as high as 40%. Right. So put another another way, um, people are asking the question, what do I want to do? Who do I want to work for? How do I want to live my life and integrate my life and my work and my learning going forward? And we've had this forced experiment to reflect on it. Um, I, I think the most, I, I tend not to use expressions the most important, but I think the most important thing for leaders right now is to be listening intently and to be as receptive and sensitive as we can be to the perspectives of workers and employees, not the same thing. Employees are people we hire, workers are people who we attract in different employment models. Um, and recognize that we've all really been exploring these choices in the last 14 months. Right. Yes, we had to work from home, but there were aspects of working from home that some of us liked. And it'll even be better. My kids are not at home anymore. They're, they're out in the world. But it'll even be better when our kids get to go back to school. Right? And that'll be real flexibility that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be able to. It would be better when we don't have four or five people using the, the Internet in our home. But we have, you know, you and your partner or just you were there um, um, working from home part of the time. I, I think we have to be very focused on this question. And there are, I'm gonna say, biases or mental models that people bring in. When you hear, and I won't name any particular company or industry, but when you hear CEOs say, you know, we're going back to the office because in, you know, that's who we are and we're an apprenticeship culture. And the only way to actually have a strong culture is to be in the same physical place. As I remind myself, 
and I think we talked about this, before COVID, half of the workplaces in the United States were toxic and half of them were great. Just straight statistics, right? It's a, being in the same place does not mean we have a great culture, right? And so the challenge for us as managers and leaders and coaches is to really think about how do we develop productivity, innovation, and, and some version of culture, whether we're doing what we're doing here today, we're doing it virtually, whether we're doing it in the same physical space or we're doing it in some hybrid combination, breaking the notion that high performing culture means that we're in the same place. Because mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that that's what we learned. I think we learn how to do high performing culture in virtual environments and physical environments and everything in between. You wound me up a little bit, Cindy. I think hopefully, hopefully that was your intention. So <laughs> I wish we could have this conversation all afternoon. And I'm just thinking about, you know, there might be a couple more follow on webinars we're going to have to schedule at some point in the future. Um, you shared a bunch of ideas, even in your answer there, that have me excited as well. And I want to um, just move on to another question. Um, the most quoted expert in your book. Work Disrupted is one of my very favorite people at the Yale School of Management, Amy Wisniewski. Hey, Amy. <laughs> um, I've been following her work since way before either of us were at Yale because when I was learning to be a coach, she was publishing her um, initial works at Michigan. Um, so you and I are both big Amy fans. Um, she mentions that or shares that her previous generations enjoyed long periods of employment and a sense of workplace membership and security that buoyed both their individual's identities and their psychological health. And that just doesn't exist today. Um, we are experiencing the ride of, as you were talking, the rise of you were talking about distributed and contingent workforces, including our virtual teams, contracts, uh, contractors and consultants, and gig economy workers. So I'm really curious, as we need this innovation where teams are ever changing, what can we do to foster that creativity and innovation where the confidence that comes from that um, established team culture of trust, safety, and you know, kind of freedom from judgment just isn't yeah. there? So Amy's work, I, so I was very fortunate to get to know Amy over the last few years and, and a couple of years before we wrote the book, one of my colleagues at Deloitte and I interviewed uh, Amy um, on the work that research she'd been doing with Sue Ashford at Michigan. And I recently caught up with Sue Ashford at Michigan as well. And um, I was really um, moved by their work um, looking at freelance workers. Now, as they point out, they're looking at freelance workers at us at a, at a, who have a certain set of status in the market. They're mm -hmm. looking at more sort of creative types, designer types, not necessarily people working in the gig economy. And what I found, this is why I kept coming back to Amy in the book, right? Um, uh, what, what she uh, has, a, one of the frameworks that she's been uh, researching, um, she asked a question that looks at four different ways that we organize work um, in terms of the purpose of the work, um, the routines that we have, uh, the relationships that we develop, and the role of place, right? And I, I think those are the four. If I don't have it right, somebody can correct me. And, and whether we're working in the office or in a hybrid way or whatever the employment model is, we need to think about these four things, right? What's the purpose? What's the relationship? What's the place? Um, what are the routines that we have? And when, as you point out in your question, if we are working on our own or in these different models, some of those things, either we need to create them as individuals, carpe diem, right? as I said earlier. But, but I think this also goes back to your question of a moment ago, which is how do we as managers, both for employees and for, I'll call them ecosystem workers, people that are working with us with different contracts, how do we help everybody who works with us to have some version of purpose, relationship, place, and routines that work for them, right? Now, I'm going to be a little presumptuous, and I'm going to tie this back to the question, and I'd love to get other comments from people on the line, the questions about um, social and political implications of what we're talking about. Um, one of 
one of my favorite quotes in the book is the discussion that we had with Lewis Hyman. Lewis is a labor historian at Cornell at the Industrial Labor Relations School. He wrote a great book called Temp. It's on the history of um, temporary workers in the United States, which he points out does not rise with gig workers in the, this century. It goes back to the, the post-World War II period and the introduction of manpower and, and even the growth of the consulting industry itself. Um, and we asked Lewis the question, which you ask when you do an interview, when you're writing a book or researching. So Lewis, what are employment models gonna look like in 2030? Are we all gonna be gig workers? That's the kind of question we ask, right, Cindy? And Lewis paused and he sort of chuckled and he said something like, you know, and I'm paraphrasing now, the future is not predetermined. Like we'll, we'll talk about the trends and I'll tell you what I think is gonna happen. And in, yeah, will we have more gig workers and alternative workers? Yes, we will. But what's an, an equally maybe more important question is what choices do we want to make about the nature of employment and how we work over the next two years? Because these are choices. Technology and new ways of working and regulatory regimes create opportunities. But what we're trying to figure out is what do we want to choose? Right. And, and this is where, and I'll look, I'm trying to look at this from a policy perspective and not a political perspective. Um, we need, we have the opportunity to make all types of work have a higher level of dignity and a higher level of functioning throughout our lives, right? And the two things that I come back to um, are one, um, it's a really interesting work being done now on the dignity of labor and the dignity of work, um, which is really interesting. Um, and you know, we learned, we all learned this when we looked at essential workers. We had this bizarre dynamic where essential workers also seem to be expendable workers. It was, you know, how does that happen, right? Um, the other thing that I think we're learning is that job transitions are part of our lives. Right. If you go back to the discussion that I was highlighting a few minutes ago of you live, you live to be 80, 90, 100, you work for 40, 50, 60 years, you have 12, 14 jobs, you're going to make many transitions. Right? And today, job transitions are pretty much seen as crises in our lives, with the exception of the first job, right? <laughs> which, which we sort of institutionally try to help you get, whether it's out of high school or college or graduate school, but every other job has a sense of this is a crisis, right? Right? Unless, you know, it's not, I'm not talking about being headhunted or recruited mm -hmm. from one place to another. The whole book, Janestown, which is about the closing of the GM plant in Wisconsin. I mean, that is a crisis for the town, the county, and everybody who lives in that, in that city. And so part of what we're trying to figure out is how do we make job transitions part of the natural flow of life? Now, from an international public policy question, and I'll just say one other thing and I'll take a breath, Cindy. We know what this looks like. This looks like flex security. This looks like what they do in Denmark and Sweden and Germany, right? right? There are programs in liberal democracies, right? With, with different flavors of political systems that actually make job transitions and ongoing reinvention part of the way the job structure is set up. These are big choices in front of us. Uh, but I think, there are, I think there are some options out there, but I know there were some questions on that. I wanted to sort of start that discussion. Yeah, the, uh, the quote that you referenced is um, even earlier than the original quote that I mentioned on page 12. This quote from Lewis Hyman was on page six and it was one of my favorite too because <laughs> okay. I had highlighted it. So it was easy to find. Um, I, I love what um, you're what you're getting into in terms of you know kind of the um, the dignity of labor and work and and I think this is really important and so um, meaningful to folks at SOM right where we 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 come here um, with the mission of of educating leaders for business and society and you know what you're really talking about right now Jeff is 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 engaging in lifelong learning and. You know, going back to what you said at the very beginning of our conversation, it's lots of new things to be curious about. And, you know, we do have choices and we have choices that we can't even prepare for yet because we don't know what the multiple choice is going to be in a year or two years or, or four years. Um, so that idea of mindset that you brought up from Carol Dweck 
and uh, and and being open to an agile is 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 um, just thank you for reinforcing this. Um, and the the challenge when I'm talking with people in, in coaching conversations is that they are coming with that crisis mentality and. You know, when that happens, I sometimes geek on neuroscience and all the blood's in the back of the brain and we're having amygdala hijacks and we're in the limbic brain and very emotive. And what you're talking about requires a lot of prefrontal cortex and, you know, breathing and reoxygenating the brain and bringing down the cortisol level. So um, there's, yeah, there's, <laughs> it's, that, that, that takes sometimes one or two coaching conversations before we can get to some of the other work. Yeah. Um, this idea of re-architecting, reimagining, redefining, redesigning. Um, so many companies are talking about it, but what I'm hearing, and I, I, I'm starting to see some of this in the in the in the Q and A um, popping up as well. Few companies seem to have um, established frameworks or internal change management expertise to foster the creativity and innovation in collaborative, safe ways. So, what do you have? as suggestions for middle level managers for leading where we are um, for both ourselves and, and our organizations? So this is a, a big question um, with many layers to it. Um, I'll offer a couple of quick observations because we could talk about this for quite a long time. Um, one, let me, let me briefly talk about what I think we're learning about change in the last 20 years that may be different than the way we thought about change, certainly even when I was at SOM in the mid 1980s. And many of our theories of organizational change are based on the idea that we go from one steady state to another steady state in a, as an organization. So I'll take implementing a computer system when you know, we spent 30 or 40 years implementing SAP and different ERP systems as the backbone of common processes and organizations. So we implement a program in the late 1990s, and the hope is that that system will work for about 10 years. So, you know, the physics of this is we have an organization at rest. We put in a lot of energy. We move it to another stable state. It takes a few years to do that. And then we run at that stable state, and then 10 years from now, we go under another program. This idea that we go from one discrete state to another discrete state, that was pretty much the view of how we view change management and transformation. We now know that that's not the case. We recognize that businesses are organic, that they're in constant motion, they're constantly growing. And you know, some of my colleagues are writing a book uh, it's coming out in September called The Transformation Myth. And their basic thesis is that organizations are constantly transforming. So it's not change management going from one steady state to another, right? So I think that's one. I think the other is, and I'm exaggerating, this is a caricature, because we have four or five generations in the workforce today, um, views of life and change are very different, right? And, and they're also different around the world. So there's some interesting research on, you know, what does it mean to be a millennial in China versus a millennial in the US versus a millennial in, uh, in Nigeria or South Africa, and 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 you know, even though people are the same age, do they really have similar cultural expectations? Yes and no is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, but we have all these workforces um, segments in the workforce. I, I will give you one of my biggest ahas in my career. Um, I was doing a project um, with a, a global company, a German company, and we were interviewing people in Shanghai. And I asked something about um, how senior executives were working with um, new managers. And the person reminded me very politely that there was such a thing called the Cultural Revolution in China in the 1960s, and that the entire generation of leaders that I was talking about almost did not exist, right? So when we think about the boomers, the boomer experience in China, particularly China, not Taiwan, was totally different, right? Okay, it, it didn't. I mean, now I'm much more sensitive to those questions than I than I, I was before. So change is more complicated than we thought. It is continuous. The other piece of it, and I'll just mention it very briefly, is when we talked about change decades ago, we were much less sensitive to behavioral economics, mm -hmm. right? 
we were we were not thinking about choice architecture. One of our great alums, Laszlo Buck, of course, who was at Google and now runs Humu. You know, um, the whole field of of social and cultural anthropology, ethnography, which is now really pulled into um, user design and experience design. Um, so both the nature of change seems to be evolving, or what we understand to be change is evolving, and then the disciplines we're applying to it also seem to be evolving. So if you're in a change situation and you, you don't see a, a really deeper understanding of the problem and a broader consideration of how it's being approached, light should go off in your head that maybe you need to think with the group that you're with on, do we really understand the problem and the nature of the change? And are we really applying the breadth of tools and, and capabilities that we can to it? Sorry, it's a big question, but a really mm -hmm. interesting one. These are all big questions. Um, and, you know, why we need so much more time and, uh, and um, space to answer them. And, and yet we'll do what we can with what we have. Okay. Um, in what you um, in what you just shared there, I just want to acknowledge that there was a comment or a question in the in the Q and A that talked about the difference in experience in architecting this change, depending on where you are in the country. And you brought out the idea of of where you are in the world. Um, so that's just really, I think, important for for any company that operates in more than you know, kind of a very small geographic area to contemplate. Um, Another question that came out in the chat or in the Q&A is about um, social services and not-for-profits and trying to raise awareness in uh, those environments where, you know, kind of being advanced or growth-minded isn't, you know, kind of at the forefront. So there's challenges for those folks as well in terms of trying to um, talk about the impact of technology and the coming disruption and preparing for that up front. So I don't know if you have a, a, a brief com comment or idea about how, how do we, you know, kind of help to open eyes where um, people might just be happy in their in their little world until until they have to change. Well, you know, we're we're talking largely to Yale and Yale management alums and friends of Yale graduates and alums, uh, SOM alums as well. Um, so the dimension of the question that looks at what's the role of being an entrepreneur, whether or an innovator, um, I'm using them interchangeably, whether we're in the, the private sector or the not-for-profit sector or um, in, in uh, working for a government agency or, or uh, working in a legislature or an executive position, um, we, you know, we, we live in an age where if, if you're not in an organization where applying the innovator's mindset is really valued, um, I, I would really think twice about where I was. Um, because uh, it's very hard to be static and for an organization to be static or to be in a position where what you do is expected to be done in a static and a, a non-changing, uh, in a non-changing way. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I was a Peace Corps associate director in the Russian Federation, very interesting thing to do. We started the Peace Corps operated in Russia for five years, not very well known. It was, wasn't hidden, but it was, you know, it was, we were there from 1993 to 1998. And, um, you know, I remember going in and we, we, uh, we, we wrote a grant, we, we were running a small business program, um, to help, uh, Russians set up businesses and, the early 1990s. And we wrote a small grant to USAID and to the World Bank um, to get some equipment and some financing for the volunteers and the government agencies that were working for cities in, in Russia. And we got a grant of like $100 million, right? Or, or something, or 10 million, I can't remember what it was. And, and I remember being told, well, your grant is bigger than like the entire budget of all the grants we've given to like any volunteer program anywhere in the world. It's like, well, okay, like, so what? I mean, it was like, you know, you know, we, this is a, we're, we're here and this is a, a moment for entrepreneurship. The agency was uncomfortable with the fact, mm -hmm. right, that we had raised all this money from outside the agency to do something to serve our mission, right? But they caught up with us, right? Um, and these are very entrepreneurial moments right now. Um, 
And I think that fits well with a lot of what we learned and a lot of the people who are attracted. I mean, innovators for business and society, I, I think that's pretty much where we live as SOM students and alums. Indeed, indeed. Um, I'm conscious of our time and we're gonna have to wrap up. I've got you know, kind of one last query of you um, in closing other than buying and reading work disrupted, would you <laughs> offer a few, you know, kind of final thoughts or pieces of advice um, to our Yale SOM community, particularly as it relates to this idea of resiliently growing and thriving in this accelerated future of work? I will. And let me give three, I will give them quickly. And, and then if people want to uh, have other comments, we'll take them. One is don't get hung up on titles. Right, we're, we're in a world that is much more team oriented, much more horizontal oriented, much more network and ecosystem and platform oriented, um, especially as you move on in your career. Um, this is one of the things that I learned being a senior partner. Um, there are only so many senior partners that can be managing partners, but there's no shortage of roles for people who are domain experts, industry experts, in my case, I'm a domain expert in the future of work, whatever that is as a, as a field. So having a sense of horizontal growth throughout your life is incredibly valuable. Don't think about titles. The second is, um, uh, this is a small one that I think we talked about the other day. I get a lot of LinkedIn requests in part because I've written this book. One of the things I observe and learn is I am more likely to look at the requests and approve it if the person writes a short note, than if they don't write a note, unless I know you. Like if you send me a note, I think I've accepted it right. I'll, I'll, but if you don't know the person, if you send a LinkedIn request to somebody and you write a brief note of any sort, I think at least from my perspective, the chance of that note being seen is much, much higher, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm just reflecting on my own behavior. And, and the third is that we are in a world of work disrupted. Um, recruiting systems and talent acquisition systems are just stressed, stretched, and out of whack, right? So, you know, I think of our own experience at Deloitte. There are many doors into Deloitte as a campus hire, as an MBA hire, as an experienced hire. Um, don't worry about knocking on too many doors find different entry points to the organization. We, like many organizations, we're big. You can go to a business division, you can go through an HR division, recruitment division, experienced hire. Um, you know, you can see a, a job request and then send notes saying, you know, who, you know, what division is this part of? Can I talk to somebody about other requirements that you have? The systems really are stressed right now. And, and so, and don't take a lack of response or a no as, a, as the final message as to whether you can actually find a position there. Just knock on different doors in different organizations in order to um, uh, pursue it. Um, and use our network, because I think we have a pretty good network. And um, um, I'll end with this um, uh, comment. Years ago, when I was a partner at Price Waterhouse, I was at a global meeting in Madrid. I saw we had somebody joining us from Spain earlier. And um, the senior partner said, we're only as good as the responsiveness of our network. Mm -hmm. So if you get a request from a partner in the firm, respond within 24 hours. If you get a request from a partner in the firm that you don't know, respond in 12 hours. <laughs> right? So to me, that was a very interesting way of thinking about especially our network and how we use our network. So people will probably stress me on that one and, and test me on that one, but I think the networking piece is very important. Cindy, thank you. And thanks uh, for people for joining uh, today. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Kayla. Uh, again, Kayla Heaslip and Alumni Relations for being behind the scenes and making all of this happen. Jeff, we didn't get to all of the questions that came through, but some of them actually did say, can we have your email? Can we have another conversation? Um, Jeff will be sharing his slides with us, so we'll be able to put those out to those people that have registered. And um, and I think your contact information was on one of the early slides as well. So it is. It's on there. I'm also like a, you know an obsessive LinkedIn user, so that's you can do that. There's a couple of emails. I think my Deloitte email is there. There's some others as well. So and you're also in the SOM alumni directory for those people that want to remember that resource. Great. <laughs>
Thank you so much for being here. And, um, and everyone, thank you for the, your really wonderful questions, rich questions, Jeff. I'll send, with, send to you the questions that we received that we didn't get to because I think those are really worth exploring as well. Um, but for today, again, thank you for, for your time and your wisdom. And um, I am excited for a lot more people to be as excited about the future of work as we are. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Take care, Have everybody. Have a great day. Thank Cheers. you, everyone.